Or my... Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me today are co-host Tom McGarry, fiber artist and potter Tanya Prather, and ASL interpreter Mary. Tanya is deeply influenced by nature, especially the patterns and texture that occur within it. She began her exploration with Echo Prints over 25 years ago while living in Virginia. Her home base is now New Hampshire, but she enjoys the opportunity to travel and work with different palettes of plants in other locations, most notably Colorado, where she just returned from. <laughs> A self-described farberitis and sometimes other things, Tanya is always trying new processes and playing with other mediums, most notably clay. She finds that those ventures inevitably spiral back and create an interesting dialogue with her core work. An echo print is a balance between the artist and the medium, requiring both intention and surrender. It is a process in which organic materials, leaves, flowers, bark, and berries are laid direct directly onto the surface of a fiber, silk, wool, linen, cotton, or paper, and then bundled and compressed. There's more to it, but I'll let Tanya explain that. It's so nice to have you back with us. Thank you for the invitation. It's so nice to come back. Yes. Can you tell us about the process of working with natural elements and how both the items you gather and the water you use changes and helps create these wonderful things we'll be seeing? Sure. Uh, so what is exciting to the process for me is that this is never the same. It's always an exploration. In fact, for me, it's a sense of play and wonder and awe. So um, working in a different place, working in a different time, uh, season, those all impact things in really subtle and nuanced ways. And even when I go back and try to repeat a process that I've kind of taken notes on and, and think, oh, I can get pretty close to this, it comes out different every time. So I really uh, am enlivened, I guess, by that sort of co-creator kind of aspect of this process because I, I influence it, I guide it, I have an intention, I use all of my artistic background in it, but there's this natural element, this organic fluidity that is part of what happens. And often that is the magic in the process. Things happen that are even more luminescent or amazing than what I could have um, created on my own. Mm -hmm. So I really love that collaboration with nature. Uh, it changes how I go through my daily life. I have this different relationship with the environment around me. So I know plants as food. I know plants as beautiful things in my garden. I know plants as herbs and healing things. But now I have a relationship with plants and how they engage in this eco-printing process. And the, you mentioned the water and, and minerals. Um, those things can, can change how the dye happens between the plant and the fiber. So the first thing to understand is that there's kind of this magic bond between plant dyes and animal-based fibers. So animal-based fibers would be like silk becomes from the silkworm, wool comes from sheep. So there's just this um, molecular, scientific, I don't understand it, but there's this bond that happens almost like um, the polar, the um, different polarized pieces of a magnet coming together that make that connection, that make that print happen. And um, so that's my favorite is to work with silk. But if I'm working with plant fibers and plant dyes, they do work, but you have to kind of put this piece in the middle to make them connect wow. and to be um, color safe and to last over time. Uh, and we call that piece in the middle a mordant. It actually comes from the Latin. Um, it has something to do with the tooth of something. So sort of the ability to bite. Uh, <laughs> and that's what it does. It allows the dye to sort of connect with the fiber and become permanent. So 
different kinds of um, metals. If I were to use a an iron pot or a copper pot or an aluminum pot instead of a stainless steel pot, which has no reaction, those infinitesimal bits of um, metal move into the water and change the color of the dye. <clears throat> So things that have been uh, done in an iron pot, the the official word is saddening, but oh. basically they become sort of dark and moody in comparison to their core color. If I use iron or I, if I use aluminum, that brightens everything. So particularly the yellows, it just kind of makes more vibrant and come alive. Everything is crisper. If I use copper, that as you might guess with copper influences the greens uh so really makes those kind of pop so um i it's it's all of these variables that keep me excited in this process over and over one of the things you recently added when you went to france as i recall was um you put in a garden and you added <laughs> Yeah. Please. Yeah. So tell everybody about the indigo. Sure. Uh, so recently when I was able to travel to France a few years ago, I had the pleasure of working in Loris, France in a dye garden where that's all they grew, uh, plants from all over the world. So I got to experiment and play with things that I had not had a lot of experience with. I tend to work in a very sustainable practice where I literally go out and gather what's in my neighborhood or wherever I'm working. I don't ship things in from other parts of the world to try them. So this time in France was an opportunity to work with a plant called indigo, which comes from this beautiful green plant. It looks a lot like basil. And coming back, I was inspired to plant that into my own garden. And, um, some years it does well, some years it doesn't do so well, <laughs> but it's very inspiring to me to start from this little seed. It's little, it's like a basil seed. It's like the teeny tiniest pinpoint of this little black seed and then to grow it through the process and then to take it through um, creating it into a powder that then becomes this blue dye. It's very different from other, from my eco printing background or from working with other plants where those are kind of like a tea. You put plants and hot water together and that kind of makes the, the dye color move out of the plant. This is a totally different process with a lot of um, chemistry behind it. So what you're seeing here is what's called an indigo vat after it's been created into a powder and then gone through the rest of this processing. In the process of creating an indigo vat, you pull the oxygen out of the dye vat. And um, that's part of, of how it all works. And what's interesting is when you first dip your cloth into the indigo and pull it out, it actually kind of looks like this lime green, almost oh, wow. like in your car. It looks very odd. And then literally before your eyes, it will start transforming from that green into blue. And what's happening is the oxygen is reconnecting with the dye and with the fiber and just transforms in front of your eyes. So uh, wow. it's an age old process. It has ancient traditions all over the world. There are actually different kinds of indigo. The kind I grow is a kind that comes from Japan. Oh, wow. um, but there are different plants that have these indicans in them that create this indigo dye all over the world. So this is an example of a t-shirt that I created. Um, another tradition that's very closely tied uh, to indigo is something that comes from Japan called shibori. And shibori is the process of creating resist through different types of, of uh, methods to create pattern. And so this t-shirt was created with a stitch resist. So literally using needle and thread in a particular pattern on the t-shirt, pulling the threads very tightly. And so what happens is it, it um, creates uh, pockets within the t-shirt where the dye can't travel in and penetrate. And so it creates these lovely patterns. 
Um, so that's been a, a nice side tangent. Um, I'm already very interested in pattern from my work with eco printing. So it just gives me a different lens or a different way to look at that. And eventually everything kind of connects back in. But I've really enjoyed having the indigo uh, to be able to add into the eco print process. It's not a print like the rest of what's happening, but I can use it uh, in the external dye bath to add some additional color and, and subtlety. This is another beautiful one that you put together and you're so, tying this together. Yes. To go make. So that's, uh, that's an eco print. The, the leaves are uh, actually sumac, wild sumac that grows here in New Hampshire. And the beautiful green background color there is coming from goldenrod oh, uh, with, uh, with a little bit of uh, like we talked about iron that makes the goldenrod um, turn into more of this olive green versus a, a lighter kind of yellowish tint. I'm sorry, I'm just <laughs> putting up beautiful examples of, of your work here. Here's another one on the blue spectrum, but this doesn't have indigo in it either, is it? It's the plants. So thing. this is not indigo. This is <clears throat> also just an eco print. So yeah. those are are literally plants connecting with the surface of the fiber and and shedding their uh, dye. Um, you can see sort of toward the bottom. There's there's kind of these lines. To me, in the image, it looks like water, but the way that that was created, those lines were actually part of a bundle. So when I lay the plants out on the the fabric or the fiber, whatever that is, I have to make sure that they're compressed or connect very, very tightly. And so often I'll kind of fold or roll sometimes around a stick, sometimes just in the bundle itself, and then maybe tie it up with string to make sure that that stays compressed and gives it time for that dye to connect with the fiber. Uh, and much like shibori, it actually is the same as shibori, it's oh. creating resist where those strings are tight against the fabric. They uh, create so much pressure that the dye can't penetrate in that area. So it ends up adding to the image that happens on the surface. These are so neat. I wanted to contrast things that you did with the indigo with dyes that came that were seeming blue, but weren't indigo at all, because mm. you have a vast color spectrum between the plants and the qualities of the water. It is amazing, sort of the, the color spectrum that you have. Um, and it's, I don't know what to say about that. It's, it, what's interesting to me, and, and um, not always obvious, is that by looking at the plant, you can't necessarily uh, anticipate the color that's going to come out of it. So it's not what we see with our visual eye through the refraction of light and all of that. It's actually the chemical process that's within the plant's interior. So um, for example, many of you might know um, like a pink or purple cosmos. I have them growing in my garden right now. I can see them outside my window. Um, so you would expect maybe those make a, a pink or a purple print. And actually that's not true. Uh, oh, often they make a print and this is especially lovely where they don't print like just a flat surface but they kind of tend to print around the edges of the petals and sort of the veins of the flowers but it usually comes out in kind of a lime green. Oh wow. Um, which is completely unexpected. <laughs> so part of the joy of this is is like I said this relationship with plants, getting to know them and getting to know what their hidden attributes are and sort of what what things to do to sort of nudge one thing or another to come out. Here you did a lot of lovely nudging. <laughs> so this is another example from that um my trip to France. Uh, and using a variety of different plants in their garden. And so uh, got to work with things that I didn't necessarily know. And there are pieces in that uh, kind of in the top right quadrant that you can kind of see are plants. Uh, and then there are other pieces that are very uh, fluid just because of the way that this was laid out. Um, I I really love that that sense of sort of 
uh, it's almost like a watercolor on silk. It, it, it just has a sense of fluidity and, and movement and light and luminosity. So even though you do a lot of pottery, your first love is, is silk, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard not to love silk. <laughs> That's true. It's such a soft, strong material. It is. And people think of it as really um, fragile and it's not, it's really a durable, amazing fiber. Um, a part of that comes from when you get something from the commercial dye industry, they, they don't want you to wash it because it will bleed. But actually through these eco print processes, I'm getting very color fast images and oh. in fact, can throw my silk in the washing machine and have it come out and still be what I created. So, um, you know, a part, a lot of this is kind of the myth that's created out of our commercial garment industry and the way that they do things with commercial dyes, which are very different. So your things are more bound to the fibers. Yes, in a lot of ways they are. Huh. And, and and this, I should explain that this doesn't sit on the surface of the fiber. Um, and I don't have a piece here, but if I could hold it up, you can actually turn it over and you can see that the dye penetrates all the way through. There are subtleties on one side versus the other, but it actually becomes part of the fiber. It actually bonds on a molecular level with the fiber. It's not like a paint that's sitting on the surface. Hmm. Yeah, or a lot of prints that we see either. Right, that are just partially there. And you turn it over and it's like blank. You have no idea. Yeah. This is another lovely piece. So this is a, a series that I did, again, straight out of my garden. I, I grow, um, in this case, this is um, some cosmos. Again, these are the orange or yellow cosmos that you see um, and a variety of other plants. What I enjoy... the I, I do enjoy just creating a print. The, the plant itself is beautiful, but part of what has become a challenge to me as I've deepened my practice and my exploration is really to use these plants as a palette, to think of them almost like having a set of paints on the side where I'm picking and choosing certain things. And so not to just have a, a plant print, but to use those plants to create images, these feel very much like landscapes to me. Um, so um, just using those to create the lights and the darks and the patterns and the shadows and the contrast and, and all of those elements in a way that uh, more traditional artists might use with other media. I couldn't not put in some pottery, even though I love the silks too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is actually a, a newer process for me. I, I have done the eco printing on pottery and I'm really enjoying that exploration. It's challenging. It's different from working on uh, fiber. Uh, pottery is a very different substrate. But this is actually a, a new process that I've learned from an artist named Tim Skull in Connecticut. Uh, and it's a process of firing with sawdust so it still integrates some plants to create images, but uh, it's also using kind of a smoke firing method. And I love the pattern that's happening, kind of that crackle pattern that's happening around the plant image. Uh, those go so well together. So that's that's kind of a, an exciting new thing that's sparking me right now to play with this. So where does he put this? Does he put the sawdust in the kiln and it goes around? I'm sorry, I just... Yeah. Wonder. So it's actually a very primitive kiln. It's um, built by laying out fire brick and literally sort of laying them out in a circular pattern. I, I call it a beehive. Yes. <laughs> um, that's just my term for it, but it's sort of creating this um, structure of fire brick. And then the pots go inside and it gets filled with the sawdust and fired. So it's literally something that I can do out in my yard. Uh, when my gardens are done for the year, I, I set up my little beehive brick kiln on top of the garden space and do a couple of firings. So oh. it's not like I have to have a commercial kiln or go and, and use something that's electric. It's, it's very natural. Wow, that sounds neat. Very, very neat. And speaking of natural, when you were... 
you just got back from Colorado, as I said, and you were saying that you were surrounded by a creek and hummingbird <laughs> and other visitors while you were there work throwing pots. That must have been amazing. It's very inspiring. Nature is such a part of of influence and to be outside in the fresh air and to hear bird song and, and the sound of the creek running and to have deer literally walking through my little outdoor studio that I've created for myself. Um, that felt like just such a perfect hole. Yeah. So you actually brought back a lot of pieces, but um, they're not fired. They're just so Wait. they are fired um, oh, sorry. So on the on the left there, <laughs> you can see a, an electric kiln. And so these have all been now bisque fired. So typically in pottery, there tend to be two firings. The first firing is called a bisque firing. It takes it from being clay, which if you, if before the firing you had put that in water, it would just go back and disintegrate. So it hardens it. And after the firing, you have a pot. It's not a very hard pot. It's still kind of permeable. You might think of it like your your clay pots that you might have out in your garden, where if they sit in water, they still absorb the water, but they maintain their their structure and, and their shape. Um, and so that's kind of what bisque firing is. In other kinds of pottery, what you would do then is put a glaze on the surface and then put them back into a second firing for the glaze to adhere to the clay and, and become harder. Uh, in my case, instead of glazing my pottery for the surface design, I'm using these other processes, either the eco printing or the smoke firing process to add this, the element of surface design. Hmm. That's really neat. I really appreciate what you do and the exploration with all your plants as well as the location, because every place you said in the beginning, and I want to emphasize that every place you go, you use what's indigenous to that region. Yeah. So for example, eucalyptus is stunning as an eco print uh, plant. It's, it's kind of the first go-to. You cannot mess up with eucalyptus. It's amazing. <laughs> Unfortunately, here in New Hampshire, it doesn't grow. <laughs> so uh -huh. while I have occasionally played with it, um, you know, from something left over from a flower shop arrangement or something, it doesn't feel right to me to order or buy eucalyptus. That's not sustainable. So I choose to work with the plants around me and in exploring those have found some, some really amazing things in our own region. That's wonderful. And the region you go to in Colorado too, do you? Completely different. So I have... I have my favorites out there. There's something called rabbit brush, which is literally just this weed that grows uh, everywhere in the desert, but it makes a beautiful sort of soft green or yellowish tint. Um, there's a kind of a maple that grows next to the creeks out in Colorado, which is much more like a bush than a tree. And it has these little maple leaves that just make exquisite prints. Um, I enjoy the cottonwoods out there. So every, uh, I know a place by its plants and I enjoy sort of watching the cycle when I, I go out to Colorado every year and I can see immediately, are we ahead of season or behind season? Are things, have they had a good water year or has it been kind of uh, droughty? So I can see by the way that the plants are in the environment, what the year has been like. Like a farmer. Yeah, kind of. The other thing that's in Colorado, which everyone knows is aspen trees, and those are lovely. They don't actually um, have much of a dye presence themselves, but I tend to use them for their resist. So I'll place them on the fiber and then put other things that are very dye heavy around them. Oh, wow. And they create these shapes um, on surfaces, which is beautiful. Wow, that's so neat. It's really... It's always so enjoyable to talk to you about this, Tanya, because your approach to pottery and to fiber is so much different from what I generally hear from people. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I definitely kind of um, stepped my own drumbeat, I guess. I, I, I find traditional processes interesting, but I really love diving into these new things and kind of pushing the boundaries, learning it enough that I know what works and then trying things on the edges. 
well, it comes up with beautiful, beautiful items for us all to enjoy. Thank you so much for doing that. And I'm sure you will continue to do that as well. Thank you. You can see Tanya's works at our November Art Gallery, along with the winners of our fourth annual children's competition. Tickets are available on Eventbrite. And we'd like to thank our many sponsors for making this program possible. Here we go. Amy Lamb, Shelley Payson, Robin Rubendunst, Susan Belkin, Helen Fremont, Caroline Scott, Philip Thibault, Lois Welber, Anita Bonglier's, Marianne Dornice Goldman, Galina Sakis, the Massachusetts Cultural Council Festival and Programs Grant, and grants from the Concord, Dracut, North Reading, Westford, and Wilmington Cultural Councils, local agencies which are supported by the Massachusetts Cultural Council. If you'd like to become a sponsor, please email us at drakeatarts at gmail.com. You can also find more information about our programs there at our website, drakeatarts.com. All of our programs are on Drake at Arts' YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Drake at Arts. Thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs>